extra couple of letters. Chauncey. Chaun- Chaunessy. Chaunessy. Like maybe Chauncey, but with an A before C E Y. It's Irish, I think. Right, that one. I even spelt Charlie your way. As opposed the, to the way E-Y. you spell my name. Yes. It's short for Charlotte in this case, so I think. Oh yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd seen I it written down, that. but yeah. Hmm. Yeah, she doesn't spell it like I spell it. Oh, it even says it on the cover a little bit. Oh, yeah, it's really, really small. small though. Okay, yeah, and that's what the 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 house looks like as well. I imagine. We don't ever see it from the outside. We don't see it at all. This is an audio format thing. We're never outside no. the house, is what I mean. I, su- I suppose, and it's never described. Okay. Right, so we've kind of <laughs> so, already begun discussion. So we're talking about the Chows of Midnight. <laughs> I pressed record in the middle of a sentence because we started talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So forward, well, I any kind I of intro. I, I Hello, Hi. we're talking about the Chows of Midnight. Yes, This is going to be our last big finish before we start the new series. Mm-hmm. Um, it's our eighth Doctor and Charlie Pollard story. Because mm-hmm. I yes. have listened to Storm Warning, which was the introduction of Charlie. Yes. Um, and I thought that was a pretty uh, pretty solid story. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it was a pretty... It was good as an introduction yeah. to these to these specific characters in the uh, Big Finish world. It's yeah. also kind of necessary for this story as well. Yeah, to know who's who. Or... And for the... Well, as we'll get to part four, uh, at the end it's links very... It clo- mm. It's very closely tied to Storm Warning and what happens in that. First Before we even get into the story itself, <laughs> what do you think of the this Eighth Doctor theme? Alright, yes, we finally can talk about this. <laughs> <sighs> I'm not sure how I feel about it, really. It's... Right. <laughs> it's quite a lot bassier and... Definitely a, a um, more electronic. Yeah, very electronic and... It's very early 2000s, I think. You think? Yeah, which mm. this is 2002. It yeah. reminds me, I don't know how many of our subscribers will know about this, it reminds me a lot of Metroid Prime. That is not actually a bad comparison. It seems you mean- very, very close to the, the Metroid music. And I actually, mm. I, I was like you at the start, I wasn't too keen on it, but every time I listen to it, it just grows on me. Mm. I really, really love it. It's... Maybe the creepiest Doctor Who theme. It's the notes. It's the notes. It just doesn't quite uh, stick with me as much as the other Doctor Who. It's Hill not a memorable themes, one. which are no. Yeah, I think the other themes they just they capture the mood a bit more. Even you know, even some of the more out there ones like Kef McKellar's version. Even you know, <laughs> that's even, a very memorable one. <laughs> yeah, but even that kind of gets you into the whole. Right. Doctor Who thing. Yeah. Be this nice. one, you you know, if this if this was all you'd ever heard of Doctor Who theme, you're not going to remember the melody. No. The melody no. is is not as important as the uh, the Just tone the and the, the feeling sound. of it. Yeah, the sound is the the important thing here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, we open up, and much like pirates, we open up with uh, music and sound effects blended together. The ticking of the clock is part of the music. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was... I loved it right from the off. Mm. Uh, that aspect it, de- it. it definitely, you know, considering the story, it definitely sets the tone yeah. for what to expect and right. ties in very closely with the story. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in that respect, it is a very well done intro. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, we open up in darkness, which is <laughs> ideal for an audio drama. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. It goes hand in hand, yes. Uh, yeah, this, this intro of... Um, them being there but they've not quite arrived yet this whole this whole they're, they're interacting with the world but not actually leaving an imprint um you know they break the jam yes. jar glass yes, and of it course. That's reforms very early on how much do you remember of the space museum well i remember they were looking around and they had to hide and that they were they were invisible or they just couldn't be seen they were there but they hadn't arrived yet they'd landed oh, before yes. they get there in time so they walk around, they're not leaving footprints. If you remember, Vicky drops a glass of water and oh, it smashes and then it comes back up and reforms. The complete darkness 
And like I say, is definitely a interesting spin on that kind of introduction because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it adds a bit more mystery to it and you're trying to figure out where exactly they are as they yeah. are. It also gives an excuse for the characters to say exactly what's going on. Yeah. You know, uh, um, as subtly as possible. Rob Shimon is a famous defender of the Space Museum. He's on a DVD extra explaining why he thinks the story is brilliant. Weren't um, there Daleks in it? There is, uh, yeah, the, the, there's a Dalek that the Doctor hides in. It's like oh, a museum exhibit. In. And then they, okay. they, I think they come back at the end as a, as a intro to the chase. Yeah, I must admit, I don't really remember the story outside of that. We watched it a very long time ago. <laughs> mm. What do you think of the Eighth Doctor? All right. In audio form after the TV movie? Yes, and I really... what do you re- think of Charlie? Yeah, I really like this Doctor in audio form. I think he works really well. Um, yeah, that perfect level of, I guess, um, performance... He's quite a light-hearted doctor in in this one a little bit, but he does have the uh, yeah, a bit of one. But it's more he like, talks it's... very quickly. Hmm. He's a but he's you never never so that it's not understandable. I've noticed he's um, he rambles quite a lot to store for time and says like he little does, doesn't he? yeah. Didn't he reminds me a little words. bit of the fifth doctor. Fifth doctor, you mm. reckon? Yeah, yeah. I suppose if a, I bit, a bit more human. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that quite emotional, quite caring. Well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I actually think he's a little bit more alien than he is in the TV movie. But in the TV movie, they did go to the effort to making him more human, even to the extent of literally making yeah. it hard for human. Exactly. <laughs> I think I prefer this Eighth Doctor a bit, a little more what we're used to. Yeah. From the Doctor. Okay, and Charlie. Yeah, she's a decent uh, companion. I think the. Definitely interesting that she's from like the past, mm. so that provides a bit of, more of a different yeah. perspective on things. And the way that she ties into this story as well proves to be quite uh, interesting. Yes, yeah, of course. She's got she's got a real character arc, which uh, yes, yeah, we don't often see. Well, we've seen it more recently with Ace. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've realised that actually we should do <laughs> something with our companions. Yeah. You know? So Rob Shearman, um, who wrote this story. Oh, he wrote this. Okay. Yeah, he's the writer. Yeah. Okay. Not just a space museum defender. No, yeah, he, that's why I brought it up, because he's, okay. he's famous for liking that story, and it reminds me of that story. Okay, cool. So his big finishes are some of the best ones, I think. Um, I was considering uh, showing you there was two others of his for the Sixth Doctor that were on my list, but I thought if we were going to do this one... <laughs> I'll give another writer's work <laughs> a look instead. Mm-hmm. Um, Rob Sherman is a writer that we will be seeing shortly in the new series. Okay. As well. I look forward to that. Yes. The Doctor mentions that the TARDIS is once again randomising uh, where it where it lands after, yeah. after having some kind of control. It's back to the way it was. But, yeah, um, so it, it was just, I guess, luck that they ended up in this place where that would would then go on, as we'll find out, to cause this paradox. Frederick. So we, we meet a lot of characters here. Frederick. Frederick. Edith. Badley. Mrs. Badley. Yeah, Shaughnessy. Sure. And Ruth. No. Mary? Mary. <laughs> Where did you Ruth? get Ruth from? I don't know. <laughs> Mary. Mary. Yeah. Scullery maids, chauffeurs... Butlers, and, yes, yeah, whole um, yeah, a, 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 I guess a decent ensemble mm. of sorts. Each character is very interesting. Yeah, very interestingly written and developed. I suppose there's a lot going on for each of them. Yeah, um, in all sorts of tones as well. Yeah, you know, there's 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 a, yeah, there's a decent bit of humour in this, mm-hmm. and some of it gets a bit dark. Yes, towards, <laughs> towards the humor. middle of it. Yeah. 
So I think Frederick and... was in the fires of Vulcan. I couldn't place the character. I did but... recognise the voice. I'm fairly and I was sure... trying to think where that might have been from. Yeah, I'm fairly sure he was in Vulcan, but I can't remember which character he was because I recognised the voice like, too. Maybe he might have been the main guy who was. Yeah, was he Celsinus? Celsinus, that's the name. I, I don't know if it was him though. But anyway, it, it could have been. I thought it was fairly obvious from the start that this was going to turn out to be something to do with Charlie. Like, mm. you know, you know, the pl- references to the plum pudding. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I... Things like that. Yeah. It, it's made fairly clear that this is going to be something to do with Charlie. And we get some some drama within the the chef and the chauffeur and... <laughs> yeah, everybody's all, got all of the some interactions, kind of drama. Exactly. All yeah. of the interactions between those people are so developed. And yeah. And you can tell that they have been together for a while there's a his there's a history there's an infant literally an infinite history <laughs> yeah. as it turns well, out well yes uh, aside from the uh, <laughs> aside from the obvious yeah but because they're all set in their roles and they that is the, the whole point is that you are the scullery maid you are the the chef you are the chauffeur mm-hmm. you know it, it gives the characters this it makes them so easy to relate to yeah there's because you're just identities yeah because you're just it's it's unrealistic. Well, it's kind of realistic, but it makes it just so easy to relate. Yeah, which is really interesting mm-hmm. because they're not even necessarily real. Well, <laughs> they are, but they're caught in an unreal event. Mm. So, uh, when is a door not a door? Did you pick one this reference? When is a door not a door? Hey. Hmm? When it's a jar. Hey. Get me out! Get me out! Oh, get me out! Oh, sorry! Again, kind of getting the, the weirdness of the mind robber vibes. I'm not sure if that was a deliberate reference to the mind robber or not. Mm, I don't know. I was just trying to think what it might be. And it just, again, something to do with paradoxes, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but that's that's a, a, obviously a big thing in this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's interesting that time in and of itself is kind of the villain here. It's a race against time, you know, everyone... Uh, there's going to be a death here soon, you know, it's always yeah, going to give you but chills. It, yeah, but it's the fact that you feel that time is a... is like an actual being yeah. that's, that has some kind of control over everything. That's what I found. Time speeding itself up. Yes, yeah. that's it. And and yeah, the and that way things like clocks having a lot more significance mm. and threat. Yeah, the ticking that's almost constant throughout is is brilliant. Yeah, that definitely adds more to the uh, the uncertainty and in intensity. Mm. Yeah, and the servants are all really horrible. Um, especially to Edith, of yeah, course. Yeah, I felt bad for Edith right oh, from the start. Did. She's just verbally abused by everybody. Yeah. yeah. She's made to not really feel like a part of anything. Yeah. And it's almost dark comedy, you know, at the beginning of part two. <laughs> Edith was never very good at timing. <laughs> yes! That's yeah. it! That's it! Yeah. Uh, uh, originally, because this is also set around Christmas and you... You kind of told me to... Yeah. Yeah. Incidentally, we're at the polar opposite of Christmas while <laughs> we're recording this. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought there was... Well, initially, before everything started, I thought there was going to be some kind of being reassured Santa. that everything's all right. <laughs> yeah. Santa, no. Um, what do you mean? What I don't do know. Mean? I don't know. Like, it just... You know, I felt like there'll be something that you might see in like a Christmas like it's gonna be really someone's gonna be like uplifted. <laughs> and... So there was the Christmas special before this, which I think was called The One Doctor, is much more like that. Oh, know? that's a Christmas special. I felt there would be some kind of arc where she learns to realise that she is worth something. And kind of is. Yeah, a little bit. It, it kind of is. Uh, but yeah, it's... we'll get to that. So, great cliffhanger, I thought, for part one. Again, the cliffhanger is almost exactly like the Space Museum. The end of part one of the Space Museum. They've gone! Yes, my dear. And we've arrived. Yes, uh, who, yeah, whoever was keeping us out has decided to let us in. 
thought the atmosphere was good as well mm. uh, and the way it was building towards a mystery and it it gives you the impression especially the way it ends with a scream it gives you the impression that it's going to turn into a murder mystery yes and it kind We've of does few... it does a little bit mm. but it's not the main point of it no as as we find out but um definitely end of part one and then part two has you thinking that and again that's um that's actually a really great thing about all the different characters yeah it's the perfect setup yeah because really, you have such distinct suspects yes. as they would be whoever thought of the butler doing it and that never happens <laughs> you know that kind yeah. of thing yeah um and, and they, they, the doctor is like a sleuth and the assistant they're detectives yeah. It kind of everyone's yeah. falling into their place, which is yeah, uh, all the pieces are there. Yeah, which is kind, of, which is exactly the the distraction that that's supposed to be. Mm. And you know, we find out that, that all of the characters are getting their own stories wrong. Uh, you know, the Chrysler's not invented yet. Oh, it must have been a Bentley then. Yeah, mixing Was it Christie. No, Christie's not identities. Yet. Yes, uh, yeah, and swapping of the roles and uh, where uh, Mary becomes the scullery maid. Oh, yeah. They I completely forget like, Edith. Fascinating. Yeah. It just... So many questions are raised here, and you're just thinking, what? It's so weird. Yeah, it can get a little <laughs> bewildering and confusing at times. Yeah. Uh, if you're not... Especially since you're not anticipating it. Right. So... And then they throw in Edward Grove is alive. Yes. What did that make you... What did you think when you first heard that? Well, I was just thinking, well, f my first thought is that maybe there is someone that we haven't met yet. Right. But another thought I had is that it might be, um, because uh, Shaughnessy turns out for the time being to be the possible suspect right. of having killed Edith, I thought that might be his real name or something. Okay, so you thought <laughs> Edward Grove was Shaughnessy. Possibly. Okay, no. I thought it was a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I mean... In a way, they later on, uh, Edward Grove uses Shaughnessy to talk, but yes. Mm. Um, but no, that's definitely not what it was, was it? No. In the end. And even in this part, you know, the characters start questioning their own stories. <laughs> they even think that they might be lying. Was it me that murdered him? Could it be me? Oh yeah, Am I Mary lying? and Frederick. They, yes. They were like, well, we both were the murderers, yeah. but <laughs> we, you know, we don't know, you don't know, I don't know. We're fairly sure it was one of us, but we don't know who. <laughs> yeah. It's very dark, funny, and a great twist on a murder mystery, I think. And like all time loop storylines, you know, there's a good cliffhanger when we end up back where we started at the beginning of part three. <laughs> With them arriving again. Yeah, I did start to suspect that there would be some supernatural force that was controlling the place. Mm. Uh, that Yeah, that was an idea that I started to think of. Well, the Doctor kind of starts saying, you know, there's yeah, someone the, in control here. Yeah, the idea of control, because, um, yeah, like, multiple characters, when, uh, like, blaming other people, it's like, oh, it could have been them, they've got shifty eyes, yeah. you know, they use the same excuse for different people. Mm -hmm. Part three, back where we started, everyone's been alived again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We start off with Edith... We find Edith dead again. <laughs> dead again and all. Yeah, there are many gruesome deaths in this. Yes, but no pain, which is, again... No, because it just happens instantly yeah. on midnight. Yes. Just, the death has just happened. Yeah, which is an inventive way to save on dialogue writing. You just loop the same thing. You only <laughs> really need to write one episode and <laughs> loop it four times. <laughs> that would have been an interesting decision actually do that. There's a Seventh Doctor, really, really cool audio drama, slight off-topic here, nice. called Flip Flop, where um, it's four parts again, like, like all of these, and the first two parts and the last two parts are swap-aroundable, so you can listen to about what, and I think they've said so they, they've called it like the, the black disc one and two, and the white disc one and two, and they don't tell you where to start. <laughs> but because it doesn't matter, you get the exact same story. That's a... uh, because of the way that the timing things work. They like go in time. They travel like to a different time halfway through, and right at the end of of both part twos. So you could listen to them in any order. That is kind of ingenious. <laughs> oh, I know. What, I know one of the next big finishes I'll be listening to. <laughs> so I, I wrote down that it's like a self-aware Cluedo. <laughs> Uh, I did get Cluedo vibes from it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> the characters asking if they've been murdered yet is so funny. <laughs> it's like, have I, am I being murdered now? Yeah, it's like, it kind of becomes a game yeah. in a way. A little bit, yeah. Which, again, links back to, to the ending where Edith is asking, you know, am I dead or am I alive? And even Charlie, you know, is Charlie dead or alive? The character's asking, have I been murdered yet? Is that yeah. how, how, where am I? In yeah. the scheme of things. Yeah, this whole... It, t- it takes, I guess, the idea of existence and flips it on its head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, 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 one of my favourite parts of this is the, is the Doctor theorising how Frederick... Uh, was run over by his own car. Yes, oh, that, that was <laughs> how he, he ran himself mm-hmm. over <laughs> inside yeah, the lo- building, I, I then took the car his... back outside again. <laughs> yeah, I just I just <laughs> love that sense. response to oh, it could have been a suicide. Like, yes, yeah. of course it was. Yeah, that's that's love me. A bit of sarcasm. Yeah, that's perfect Eighth Doctor, and I think that's very unique to the Eighth Doctor. Hmm. So we find out what Edward Grove is. Yes, I have to say, I real, I actually quite liked the twist as it happened Mm. uh yeah edward grove is the house yeah which then gives you the perspective that oh it's it's like a haunted house story essentially um but instead of like yeah instead of knowing that it's a haunted house beforehand it's revealed like towards the end which i think is actually a really great way of doing it yeah um yeah, because of all the extravagant things going on, it mm-hmm. could be anything. But it's not just and a haunted then... house. The house is haunting itself. <laughs> it's not That's haunted true. by ghosts. That's true. It's and literally it's not... the house. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is what I wrote down. It's a game of Cluedo where the board did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> that is perfect. Yeah. I, it, there's no other way to explain it. Really. <laughs> Such a brilliant idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I basically said, so the whole thing's basically a weird cult run by a haunted house. <laughs> a little bit, yes. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. it ends up running this It's running this infinite time loop to make itself alive. Mm-hmm. I, w- I wonder what the paradox could be. Mm. So did you have any idea what that was going to be, the paradox that started this all? Um... I don't think I... I don't think I did. I don't think I caught on to it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, it's not necessarily obvious at all, mm. but, yeah, so we we try and escape the house in the TARDIS. Yeah, but the house they, is... They, the house the is going is with them. part of it, yeah. Yeah, they can't escape. And that's where we end off part three. Yeah, I guess that's kind of a similar to... It's kind of similar to the end of part one of Fires of Vulcan, yeah, realising that yeah. the... The TARDIS is linked to whatever situation they're in, so that mm. there is literally no way to escape. Mm. A little bit, I suppose so, yeah. yeah. And then the final part. So they try and go inside the TARDIS, and they end up back in the scullery. And they go inside the TARDIS again, and it's the scullery, so it's like the reverse of the Time Monster. Yeah, that's what happens, yeah. It's like, yeah. instead of a TARDIS in a TARDIS, it's not a TARDIS in not a TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs> and then Edward Grove reveals himself. And starts talking. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that removes a bit of the... It does. The mysteriousness. um, And brings it a bit more... Well, not down to earth at all. But, yeah, it's a bit less... Yeah, it's just less mysterious. It is. And it's the same kind of thing where in Seeds of Doom, where the crinoid starts talking. It removes that element of... You can't even talk to it, you can't reason with it, and it makes it less scary, less mysterious, yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess what it means is that in yeah, instead of trying to face the the of Edward Grove in its in its house form, I suppose, instead of just trying to figure out what could be done to, you know, stop this whole thing, yeah, it gives it a more yeah, I guess it's a it gives bit it literally easier. a face to put to it. Yeah. Yeah. So Instead there's of less being a working thing. things out. Yeah. Like, oh, what if we try this and this and this? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I do sometimes not like when non-talking villains suddenly just start talking. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and then essentially revealing everything mm. about them. Yes. Yeah. 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 
And then it becomes kind of a explanation, the explanation part. Yeah. Where, where okay, yeah. now let's tell you what's going on here. It was a lot to take in. Um, and yeah, it just gives you a lot more uh, context and it, and yeah, it fully reveals other things about Edith as well and mm -hmm. how she ties into Charlie's life yeah. and that whole thing. And that's where the, the arc I thought would happen kind of happened, yeah. you know, realising what life means, yeah. in a way. Mm -hmm. a, a, a lot, lot in, a in a little, little amount of time, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Um, it's quite complicated and it is quite hard to take in, but I think it does make sense. Oh no, it, it makes sense. I, I got I got it. A lot, yeah, a lot of it seemed like it was reserved for part four. You know, Edith, obviously, when she heard what had happened to Charlie in Storm Morning, or what had not happened to Charlie <laughs> in Storm Morning. Like... Suicide, that's another main theme that really crops up at this point. Yeah. More so than anything, really. Yeah, even the Doctor, you know, trying to get Shaughnessy to kill, kill him. him. To stop Edward Grove. Ah, oh, I... Yeah, again, that came out of nowhere, and I was thinking, wait, what? what? How would that... Yeah, sort of anything. I don't know. The whole paradox itself is playing out all of the horrible things that Edith has gone through in her life, condensed into two hours, which really just... Oof. That's not... Yeah, that's not a great existence, really. No. No, you yeah. really Infinite feel for Edith. turmoil. Mm. And, yeah. of course, Charlie being alive is, is the paradox. Yeah. Um... So did you link that back to Storm Warning? Not exactly. No? I, f I figured... Because this was made... Were, were there any stories in between? Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay, they I figured that... that yeah, that's... Well, that's what I did pick up on, is that, oh, this must be some kind of past experience. But I didn't particularly think Storm Warning. Because in Storm Warning, obviously, they're on that ship, which then goes on to crash, but the Doctor rescues her. Yes. Yes. So that's the why I asked you to listen to Storm died. Warning. That she should have died yeah. then. But yes, exactly. She didn't, yeah. So that's why I asked you to listen to Storm Warning. Yeah, no, now that I think about it, that actually makes total sense. <laughs> I can see a lot of influence on some new series stories. Okay. Uh, on this, there's some parallels with like a couple of Matt Smith stories, I think. Oh, right. Um, uh, this paradox itself, uh, with Charlie supposed to being dead, does come back later in this 8th Doctor Charlie run. Okay. There's a whole... Um, there's lots of interweaving plots that eventually builds up to what I believe was the 40th anniversary story of Doctor Who called Zagreus, which uh, right. is on Spotify as well. Maybe you'll get around to it. It's... Is that separate to Big Finish? Is no, that no, that's Big Finish. Oh, it is. It's a Big Finish 40th anniversary story. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought it was really bad. <laughs> oh. I, I did not like it at all. Oh, well. But this whole, uh, and this relationship between Charlie and the Eighth Doctor is a really, really interesting one. All right, then. Yeah. And of course, it does end up being a sweet ending, actually. Yeah, you know. I liked that about it. I guess that's where the Christmas spirit comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, giving Edith some reassurance that she does matter. Yeah, it, it, you, you feel it's a bit nice heartwarming at the end there. Yeah, um, yeah. Actually, before, yeah, so j j I forgot this part, actually. Um, the, the, yeah, the script is just so, so good. Um, one of oh, my yeah. favourite lines is Edward Grove saying that he wants a few seconds of eternal life, <laughs> which is just so good. Yeah, and in a way, that's what he, is what it's had. Yeah. It's two, well, two hours. Yeah. So. Two yeah. hours of eternal life. Yeah, the, yeah, the idea of, of time mattering and mm. having importance yeah. to to people yeah and really. specifically what memories affect us the most yeah really great themes really great scripts mm -hmm. and the production is great as well yeah no complaints there yeah like the last little bit the last few minutes was just a nice a nice wrap up and yeah it, uh, a nice calm down after the storm yeah <laughs> yes yeah that last scene with Edward Grove um, then convincing Edith that she does matter and also trying to get Edward Grove to not be alive. Um, the heartbeats in the background and the echoing of the voices. Really that was very epic. frequent, and that actually got under my skin a little bit. Yeah. The way it builds up. Mm. 
the tension building is so good, and yeah, mm -hmm. with the countdowns and the time speeding up, it knows it plays with time and tension very, very well. Yeah, that actually, yeah, that was a, the end of part two when the when it's mm -hmm. about to become midnight. That that cliffhanger really got me because they don't reveal who was killed, and so like it, yeah. it left just left me guessing who was it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who was it? Yeah, um, yeah, I really. I really liked this story a lot overall. Excellent, yeah. Um, definitely one of my favourite big finishes. <laughs> ah, no, get out of the way. There we go. Okay. Cool. So, that concludes our short journey. A short trip, if you will. <laughs> uh, into Big Finish. Uh, it's been fun delving into this, uh, into this part of Doctor Who. I think it is a really... A really great initiative you mm. know, to give us a lot more Doctor Who with some of the, you know, the, the classic Doctors. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the new ones have done, David Tennant has done some as well. Yes, he did mention Um Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's expanding the, the world a bit. It's massively expanding. Yeah, and, to and, the extent and, almost, I think, too much, where <laughs> it becomes difficult to keep track of everything. New series next week, guys. Oh yeah, we finally get there, and yes, I'm very much looking forward to uh, kind of returning. I right, see, see you for you. that. <laughs>